right. So give me just a second. We're checking this out real quick. We should be live. Uh, let me know if we are live or not. I'm reading my phone because y'all are a remote production team, as normally happens. See me. So over on the NASA Space Flight Channel, let me know if everything's good. Audio, video, 5x5. Five five. We're standing by. We're going to be talking with astronaut Ricky Arnold here very shortly. Just want to make sure that you can see and hear him when he steps on the stage before we actually just start getting into things here. So you hear, you see us? All right. Good deal. So here's what we're going to, get to, going to do. Give me about... 60 seconds here. We'll get Ricky up here. EJ from Twitch is going to be talking with us as well, and we'll do a little bit of a QA, and a little bit of a discussion with Ricky, but give us about 30, 60 seconds. I just make these numbers up on the fly so they don't match. Did not go through astronaut training myself. We got the confirmation. Let's get the actual confirmation and let us know that everything's still good. If it's not, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we are here to spend a little bit of time with astronaut Ricky Arnold. Ricky, thank you so much to be here again. for hanging out. Uh, I'm Thanks John Galloway with Thank NASA you. Space Flight. This is EJ, who's one of our, uh, one of our, it's not like I, I own you or anything, our educational Twitch streamers who helps out with the outreach here. But Ricky, thank you so much. My pleasure. For great to be today. here with you guys. This is fantastic. It's, it's been awesome. a great uh, couple of days. Yeah, yeah you've been doing it. all sorts of presentations with Kids Week, right? Yeah, yeah. Had, we've been talking, uh, sharing some highlights, mission highlights, and right. also working with uh, one of our flight directors, what it takes, a, what the team has to do to get ready, someone ready to go do a spacewalk. Yeah, that's the presentation that's coming it's up next, coming, I yeah, think, yeah, right? Yeah, Allison, yeah. yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Spacewalk's a team sport is the presentation, so if you stick around until 3 o'clock Eastern, that's what we're going to see here on the stream. Come up shortly, uh, yeah. But for now, you, how did you get into this? You have something to do with EJ, I think. Uh, Woods Hole. Oh. So, <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Massachusetts, and you you, uh, you are at Woods Hole. Like, what, what do they do at Woods Hole? It's, it's scientific research, right? Yeah, oceanographic research, yeah. but there's a, an organization uh, called the Sea Education Association. And prior to working at NASA, I had actually worked as an assistant scientist oh, okay. on one of their sail training vessels. That's cool. Um, yeah, it was, uh, awesome. it was a great experience. I, did, I was only there for a short contract yeah, yeah. Uh, prior to starting uh, public school teaching. Yeah. And uh, But when I went and interviewed at NASA, that was something they really were very interested in because I guess uh, deploying sci scientific equipment in, the, in an extreme environment is kind of what we Close do. Close quarters, quarters, yeah. That sounds familiar. All right? that good stuff, yeah. There's a lot of, with the presentation you'll be giving, there's a lot of similarities between being underwater and being in space, because right. the training you did was actually underwater down in Florida, right? That's right, yeah. When we first started doing spacewalks during the Gemini program, um, we we were really ill-prepared for what microgravity would be like, and Buzz Aldrin, uh, you know, who's Apollo 11, right, right. Um, was part of the Gemini program, and he was also an avid scuba diver. And he was the one, along with some other folks, who came up with the idea we could be training this in a neutral buoyant, uh, buoyancy lab. Right. Um, and getting people ready for what microgravity might be like. And so they developed a lot of the techniques and tools back then uh, that we still use to this day. So that's yeah. the, the NBL, right? The NBL, training in water, neutral buoyancy, the importance of handrails and handholds. The first spacewalk, there was really nothing to hold on right. to. You're not standing on it. Yeah, you're not standing. Yeah. You're not free floating in space. And it's not like you can swim or do anything you need to get where you need to go. Didn't you need they to... give them like a compressed air gun? Like, they were, they were just like, yeah, like oh, just yeah, point that that yeah, way and go that imagine way. Imagine when you're floating in every <laughs> like a fire action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been to space multiple times. Two, two times, times, twice, two times. yeah. And you have the distinction of flying on two different types of spacecraft, right? It's correct. Flew on the space shuttle uh, Discovery in 2009 and flew on a Soyuz out of uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan in uh, 2018. Yeah, so tell us a little bit of how are those two things different? Like Soyuz They're both just versus epically shuttle? cool. I mean, they're just really iconic space vehicles, yep. right? And uh, I feel like I got to be a part of a small, very, very small part of, of space flight history by being able to fly on those two vehicles. The shuttle had extreme capabilities for carrying a lot of people and a lot of payload up to a low Earth orbit. Right. And the Soyuz is just a workhorse, a reliable workhorse for getting people to and from low Earth orbit. And 
just it was a really really uh, that, that made two great bookends for for my career and I hope we get to fly again someday but I'm pretty happy with uh, those two opportunities you, you made you made a comment yesterday about the shuttle is sort of being like a lumbering truck. Yeah, like you, carrying you stuff walk to space. Up, the whole thing's it's just you, it's making noises, it's groaning, and um, and it's just it, to get that much mass off the Earth. Right. It's a pretty um, pretty uh, well controlled but violent explosion to make right. that happen. Right. The Soyuz is just a it's a much less mass and. Uh, but the, the feeling of acceleration is the same in both vehicles, but it's just that the shuttle had something about it, just knew you were part of a very small part of something really big. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just I can't imagine like the difference between riding, because one was a little bit smoother, one was a little bit bumpier, like Soyuz is all liquid engine, so it's a little bit, is that it was, true? It was no? a little bit of a smoother ride, um, except for staging in Soyuz was right. much more dynamic, much like what you see in you know Hollywood films, right. and, or the old Apollo or Mercury, where the, 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 the fuel burns out on the stage, the vehicle separates, and you know, you're kind of thrown forward, and then the engine behind you lights, and you're thrown back in your seats, and that <laughs> like was, that exaggerated. Was, that was, yeah, that was absolutely awesome. Excellent. So I, I saw, um, we're, I don't think we'll see it in this presentation, but I saw in the Soyuz something that I learned that the seats actually move before you land. They stroke, and yeah. And it like jumps you up all of a sudden. It, it is almost, that what almost kind of folds you up against the dashboard of your car. It's kind of like <laughs> it was, you know, you're like you release and, um, and it's just to get your back and your spine aligned in proper position in your neck for impact with the earth because you basically back into the earth uh, when you land on a Soyuz. It, it looks like one of those like bad carnival rides, right? Where you're there and then the cranks down and it's all jerky and stuff. Because when those seats move, you're in this nice laid back position. And they go chunk all of a sudden. It's not a slope, but uh, uh, I remember when Scott Kelly came back after his first Soyuz ride. He said, "I would do another go to the space station again just for the ride home, <laughs> because nice. the ride home was just so amazing." Yes. Yeah. And they, he was absolutely right. Yeah. Is there like in terms of Soyuz and shuttle? A shuttle, you sort of land on the runway and then yeah. you put a ramp up next to it. It's like getting off a jetliner almost. Yeah, right? yeah. And in Soyuz, you're crawling out this teenie, tiny little hole. Or like, getting yanked the, out of the yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're trying to do a military crawl, and people are trying to help get you out. And you, of course, we were pretty deconditioned. We'd been in space for 197 days, so uh, they kind of pulled us out and carried us to a, 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 a park a lounger out in the middle of the steppes of Kazakhstan. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a it's a, an amazing sensation. Sometimes when the Soyuz lands, the parachute pulls it over on its side, and it can drag. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you you can land in different orientations. Oh. And sometimes <laughs> the crew is able to orient in a good position to get you out. And yeah. The vehicle will roll a little bit. They actually rolled us a little bit to get the hatch in a more yeah. convenient location for them. Yeah. So so you're like landed in the Soyuz, and was yours on its side or was it, was it on its side? I was I was on my side. I was because everything was falling on me, and everyone was kind of <laughs> leaning. And I was kind of curled up in this ball and uh, they kind of rolled it around and uh, so the commander was kind of on the ground and then pulled us pulled us out of the There's house. a sign on the side that says in Russian, this side up. This side up, <laughs> yeah. They roll you over. Yeah, you those guys, the search and rescue, that's what they do. Yeah. So they know exactly what they're doing. It's an amazing team they have out there in a pretty yeah. remote location. Excellent. So we actually have some questions from online. All right. And uh, people have been posting up a couple questions that are watching back at home. They told me to pick and choose. So I'm not like reading my phone. It's like, oh, I interview an astronaut. I'm just going to read my phone for a bit. This is nice. Um, let's see here. Some astronauts. OK, some astronauts note arriving at the prop loaded vehicle on launch day is impressive or intimidating with the sights and sound of, a, of an alive vehicle. What was your experience as you were sort of like approaching the space shuttle? It was. It, it's this breathing vehicle. Uh, the space shuttle is, it, you have all this super cooled oxygen and, and hydrogen. So met, you hear the sounds of metal creaking. You hear the, uh, um, it, you just get a sense of th this is something that is not static. Something really awesome is about to happen shortly. Yeah. And, and the Soyuz is similar. It was covered, with, I remember the, it was covered with ice as we're going up the elevator and ice was flaking off and the thing you're as you're getting on it's it's also moving in position um yeah it's it's pretty wild it's, it's something that i've never thought about that's a great question because yeah. do you feel a difference and you've got a spacecraft and you've got a shuttle that's sort of being worked on it's not on the pad it's not prop loaded it's not ready to right. go right right does it feel difference when you different when you know that that thing is ready to oh, launch yeah, yeah. it's got fuel like, we did a, with the shuttle we did the, the terminal countdown demonstration test a few weeks before we launched so we right. would go down learn how to get out in case there was an accident and we actually strapped in the vehicle and kind of went through like we were going to launch and it is definitely a different experience when there is 
prop loaded on it. Yeah. I, I like yeah. the term breathing. Yeah. We, we see like the outgassing. We see yeah, the, the venting and stuff. Yeah. Well, you're and you're hearing it all there, and then when you get inside, you're feeling it. Yeah. So you're in the spacecraft, and you can yeah. feel it oh, feels yeah. different yeah. when yeah. it's ready to go. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. God. All right. And this is this is how complicated we are. I'm reading the questions off my phone. Uh, let's see here. We talked about some of the differences between Shoyu's and shuttle and launch and landings, right? right? Um, the shuttle is like a lumbering truck, and the right. Soyuz is a much smaller rocket. Um, the landings, the shuttles are nice and smooth. What's the difference between the landings? Yeah, the shuttle ends on a runway, so right. it's a pretty smooth landing. Um, your family's waiting for you there. They, like you said, a ramp will pull up and help you get out. The Soyuz, uh, you know, the physics is similar. You're, you're taking all this energy of motion, kinetic energy, and you turn it into friction to slow down the vehicle. You turn it into heat. So they both have get surrounded in plasma and flames. Um, it's just uh, when the shuttle comes out of that, it's it's then gliding to the Earth, just bleeding off energy, gliding to the Earth. So you've got the some Soyuz control. is controlling, but it's controlling um, in a different way. And then once the parachute comes out, it gets even more dynamic because it takes a little while for it to fill. So as it's filling, you're kind of getting whipped around on the end of <laughs> at the end of the lines. And then when it does fill. Uh, you'll, it looks really peaceful in the video. It's kind of billowing, right? And so, right. isn't that really nice? But while it's billowing, you're getting pulled up and down. It's, it's like, like a yo-yo. Like at the end of a jellyfish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you land uh, the soft landing rockets fire. The shuttle comes to a nice gentle roll at the end of the runway, yeah. whereas the, the Soyuz fires rockets to slow you down just before impact, but you still hit the ground with a, with a pretty, good, the pretty good thud. Yeah. No kidding. Um, Let's see here. I'm, I'm getting through as many questions because we only have three minutes left. Thank you again so much for your time Absolutely, here. my pleasure. We, yeah, we no, don't get a chance to do yeah, this very this often, cool. so we no, really appreciate happy you. Happy to do it. Uh, commercial space yeah. is doing, making inroads. Suborbital space tourism you've talked about in your right, talks earlier. Right. SpaceX is Mars vehicle, the Starship. Um, are you okay with celebrities spending a few days getting a flight suit and then being called astronauts? Like, what are commercial astronauts versus space tourists versus astronauts? Like, how do you feel about that? Right, That's so, sort of the hard question, yeah, right? Yeah, I don't lose a whole lot of sleep over it. Yeah. You know, our, uh, what we're doing is very different. I mean, we're, we're professional astronauts. We're trained. That's our job. That's our profession. And that's our calling. Um, I guess technically, though, if you get to get up you know, above 100, or we're, we're, we're defining it as these our, days. Our, yeah. Our friend told us earlier today, um, you you are classified as someone who's left Earth. So if they call themselves astronauts, I, yeah. I, one way or the good. other. The more people we get in the space, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, I yeah, I don't, I don't want this to be limited to celebrities. I think uh, the the we, we're on the cusp of space becoming more accessible to everyone, and I think that's uh, that's NASA's goal, and it's certainly one of the things uh, I, I aspire uh, for. For, for all of us to have yeah. that opportunity to see our Earth from from that perspective. Absolutely. I'm, I think we got time for one more question sure. here. Let's scroll down. Uh, this is a good one. What was the most unexpected thing you learned from training? Did you get in, into training for an to be an astronaut and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, what? You want me to do what? Um, the unexpected thing is we all have gifts that we have not even begun to unwrap, right? The only way you learn what you're capable of doing is by being challenged and figuring it out. I like it. Um, uh, and that is absolutely true. I started that at age 39. There was things I never thought I would have an aptitude for. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean every part of the astronaut job is I can do great. I, but I can do them adequately. Sure. But there are things I found like, wow, you know, I had not considered this when I was 16, 17 years old, kind of wish I would have challenged myself a little bit more back then to figure out what some of those so those sort gifts are. Where your limits are, what, yeah, what, what you can yeah, do. But we, it's, humans are pretty remarkable and we do, we're capable of, capable of things that we probably can't dream of at times. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's one of the things we always love to talk about is, you know, you're an astronaut, you've been to space twice. Yeah. But you made it to space because there's a team of thousands of people back in the Oh, my. Oh, yeah. Engineers, yeah, just everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a very small part of a team that makes all this happen. And um, and it's I get the honor of getting to go. But yeah. it's it's a it's a total team it's, effort. It's a lot of people working together using yeah, different types of skills. Of, I mean, there are accountants involved, right? Of course. They don't end up in of space. Course, yeah, They're yeah, not engineering yeah, rockets. That's right, yeah. we got to pay for rockets. So that's even right. everybody helps get to space. And right. it doesn't matter what your skill set is. You can help. You can be a part of what's happening. Be a part of the mission. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ricky, we'll cut you loose here no, and uh, let you start to get set up. Thank Thanks, you again John. so no, much for pleasure. spending time with us. Thank you, sir. Oh, Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you. if you guys just want to hop that way, I'll talk because I know you still need to get mic'd and stuff. Um, 
Folks, again, we are playing this fast and loose. I keep looking at my phone, right? Uh, it is now 2.50, so that puts us about 10 minutes away from the presentation. We're going to have uh, Ricky Arnold back up here, and we're also going to have a bunch of astronaut training. I'm not gonna use the term toys, but I'd like to play around with them. Uh, a bunch of astronaut training gear, because Allison Bollinger, uh, NASA flight director, is going to be talking with Ricky about spacewalks being a team sport. So we sort of ended on the note there that it's a, a lot of different types of skills in order to get people into space, both when you're up there and when you're launching stuff, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about that shortly. We're gonna go to the Be Right Back just for a couple minutes, get them all mics. Next time this table's back, there's gonna be a bunch of cool astronaut stuff on it, and I appreciate y'all hanging out. Give us about 10 minutes for that presentation to start.
Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for coming to the Intrepid Museum. I'm Mike Massimino. I'm an advisor here at the Intrepid, and I got to work with both of these uh, friends uh, behind me here. I was an astronaut for uh, 18 years with NASA, and I got to work with, uh, with both Allison and, and Ricky, so I get the uh, honor of getting to introduce them today. Um, Allison, uh, I, I first met her when she was a, a, a new instructor uh, teaching us how to spacewalk when she first joined NASA. Her background was she's an aerospace engineer from Purdue, worked at NASA while she was still in college, became uh, an EVA instructor and fly EVA is spacewalking, that's what all these fancy tools and she'll explain to you what all that means. Uh, she became the leader of, the, uh, of, that, of that team, which is a pretty high level position to be in charge of all the spacewalking instructors and the flight controllers. She learned from there to, to be, in, she was in charge of our training pool. I'm sure you're gonna talk about that. Uh, great place to, to, uh, to learn how to spacewalk. So she was in charge of that facility and now she's a flight director. And I think Ricky pointed out uh, yesterday that there are a lot of astronauts. It's right. like a dime a dozen. Yeah, you can find us It's like anywhere. hundreds. Yeah. And it's like two of them right here, yep. right? And it, <laughs> but you only have one only flight one director here because there's not that many flight directors. There's less than 100. 97 to be exact. 97 in yeah. the history of the program. If Since you, 1960. Is that amazing? It's, you know, Gene Kranz, the guy with the crew cut from Apollo 13. Yeah, you know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. So, yeah, you remember Allison, sure. So, uh, so Allison is a fl and now a flight director, which is a really cool job at NASA. My friend Ricky and I, we met when Ricky became an astronaut. I, was a, I became an astronaut in 96, and Ricky came in 2004. Right. A very interesting background uh, as a scientist and as an educator. Lots of experiences that are pretty extraordinary uh, around the world, really. He had right. very international experience before becoming an astronaut, and uh, became an astronaut in 04, was also trained by Allison and um, flew in space twice on the space shuttle to help build the International Space Station. It was a spacewalker putting, uh, putting a big solar panel on there. Mm -hmm. the, last, the last solar array, right, was right. put on yep. your mission. Well, we'll see a video and of that. You'll see that. And uh, I'm going to get off the stage here. But he also, because you guys, this is... He's you guys pretty much given friendly. the presentation, but, so but, yeah. but Ricky also flew more recently as a long-duration crew member. So he has very interesting experiences of flying both on the shuttle and building the space station and then flying on the Russian Soyuz and living there for six months. So I'm really delighted that my two friends are here and thank you for coming. I think you have a very interesting uh, hour or so, however long it takes, half hour, 45 minutes. Well, I'm eating up all their time, so I'll let you go. But yeah, but six thank, minutes please, left. please welcome them. Uh, <laughs> here's an Good luck. All right. I don't think so. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a great introduction. So like I said, I'm Allison Bollinger, and I've got Ricky Arnold here. We work at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And today we're here to talk to you about spacewalking and how it truly is a team sport. So what you see a lot of, if you watch NASA TV while we do spacewalks, is you've got two people out there in the white puffy suits getting all of the glory, doing all the work, but it truly takes a team of hundreds of people on the ground to make them ultimately successful. So we'll talk a little bit about our backgrounds and some of those experiences, and then we'll have time for some questions at the end. So Ricky, any opening comments, or should I just get going? Well, the Mike just left, so I can say something nice about him. <laughs> but uh, part of the spacewalk training, he was definitely part of my spacewalk training team. When I arrived, uh, not only did I have regular instructors who would mm -hmm. help teach us the basics, but we also had people like Mike who were kind enough to spend, spend their time mentoring new folks on what is it really like to do a spacewalk uh, in and around the International Space Station, or Mike had been on the shuttle and done several spacewalks. So that team includes people who have already flown in space. And so I wanted to thank Mike. And now that he's gone, is there anything else nice we can say about him? Nah, okay, all okay. right. We'll, we'll keep going. All right, so a little bit more on my background that Mike alluded to. I grew up in central Ohio loving math and science and space. How many people out here love math and science and space? All right, you guys are in the right place. How many of you want to be an astronaut when you grow up? So my hand, my hand was raised too until I was, I don't know, maybe 15 or 16, and I realized I'm, a, I'm afraid of heights. I get car sick. I don't ride roller coasters. 
maybe I don't want to be an astronaut, but I knew that I still wanted to really work for NASA. So I went to space camp a couple times in sixth grade, and you can see me with my perm and my braces. And then I went again a senior in high school. Um, I went to Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, where I majored in aerospace engineering there at Purdue. And as, as Mike also mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be a part of the cooperative education program, or internships. So what that meant is it extended my graduation date by a year, but I was able to spend a semester at Purdue and then a semester down in Houston working at Johnson Space Center, testing out my degree to make sure it was the right fit for me. So I cannot stress the benefit of internship enough because it's a really great way to make sure you are in the right field for you before you spend all that time and money getting a degree only to realize it's not really what you like. So I graduated from Purdue in 2004 and I've been working at NASA for about 15 and a half years now. And what's the unique story is, even though Ricky is much, much older than me, we actually started at NASA the same year. We both started in 2004. So he's got a much different journey about how he ended up here. Um, so I spent a majority of my 15 years at NASA training astronauts to do spacewalks. And like Mike said, I am now a flight director. So what a flight director means is I'm the person with the ultimate authority over first and foremost keeping the astronauts safe, keeping the space station safe, and completing our mission objectives. Keeping us busy. And keeping them busy. Yep. So I do a majority of my work in mission control. There I am uh, right there. And someone, he, Mike had mentioned Gene Kranz from Apollo 13. So the neat pictures over there on the right, I was actually able to meet Gene. He gave a lecture to the interns. So this is when I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed college student in 2001. That's Gene on the left. <laughs> you might know from the flat top. No, and then uh, the lower picture, I was able to actually reconnect with him in July as we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. So it was neat to be able to come full circle, shake his hand, and proudly say, I'm now a flight director standing, you know, working in mission control just like you did all these years ago. So another thing to point out is uh, my call sign is Athena Flight. So uh, starting way back with Dr. Christopher Kraft, who was the original flight director, his call sign was Red Flight. Gene was white flight. You might have seen in Apollo 13, he's wearing that white vest. So by the time you get to number 95, we're all out of colors and elements and minerals. And so I chose Athena, who's the goddess of wisdom and courage, and figured that was pretty appropriate as we look forward to what we're getting ready to do here at NASA, going back to the moon and on to Mars. So I'll have a little bit more about my flight director role later, but we can hand it over to Ricky, and he can talk about himself. This is me without the perm. And uh, yeah, I grew up in Maryland. I was a huge, uh, I loved playing baseball. I was, a, I was very interested in what NASA was doing, even as a child. Uh, that's actually me in an astronaut outfit that I got for Christmas one year. My sister and I, I'm sure she loves the picture with the bell bottoms, uh, <laughs> down at Kennedy Space Center, where I got to see Apollo Soyuz launch uh, many years ago. Uh, but I, it seemed both of those dreams, baseball and, and working for NASA, seemed like they were just something that other people did. Um, I, I was really interested in science, uh, but I ended up becoming a science teacher. Um, after getting out of university, I taught in Maryland, in public schools in Maryland, grades 7 through 12, uh, before heading overseas. And I taught in several schools with multinational uh, student bodies, including, including Americans and host nationals. And, in Casablanca, Morocco, in the Middle East, in Far East Asia, and also in Eastern Europe, before, uh, a little later in life, <laughs> applying to become an astronaut in 2003 with not a s sincere expectation of getting selected, but at least wanting to say, I tried. And uh, much to my surprise and much to my joy, uh, I was selected to become an astronaut and reported to Johnson Space Center in 2004 right around the time Allison, Allison showed up. So we've got a bit more photos if you want to talk about any of these. Yes, 2009, after arriving in 2004, I had about a two-year kind of astronaut school where you get qualified to fly in space. We learned to fly jets. We learned to fly um, the space shuttle. And we learned how to fly the space station. Um, we had to learn to speak Russian. There was a bunch of stuff we needed to learn to do, learn to spacewalk, learn yep. to fly a robotic arm. I kind of graduated from that program, was eligible for space flight, and was assigned to a space shuttle mission, flew in 2009, did two spacewalks on that mission, um, and came back, supported other people, helped train other astronauts, and in 2017, I was assigned to fly back to the International Space Station to be a part of the, this crew of fine musicians. Um, 
and do three more spacewalks during the course of a 197-day stay on the ISS. And those are some of the patches from, uh, from those missions. And so, Ricky, what, uh, what instrument are you playing in this photo? Uh, well, there's only two guitars on ISS, and those guys grab the, and I play guitar. Uh, they both play better than I do, and plus they got to them more quickly than I did, so uh, we were missing a drum, and that drum actually fits very conveniently underneath the toilet seat and is used to capture um, waste. This, this was one that was, empty or full? That one's empty. Okay, okay, when I, that okay. That picture came down, someone actually went into the inventory, found what it was, and when this picture came down, because it's even in Hobby Airport, Oh, that picture. That picture is they posted, uh, posted online that this, this is what that bucket is for. It's not really a drum. It's not really a drum. <laughs> right, so Ricky has had a really unique experience in that he was able to launch on both a space shuttle and a Russian Soyuz rocket. So we've got a couple of these launch videos that will show. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Oh, sorry, but, but, first, but first, but first, let's talk about the International Space Station. So have you guys heard about the International Space Station? Has anybody been able to see it pass overhead at night? Yeah. yeah. So on a, on a clear night, when it's aligned just right, it'll take six minutes to get from one side of the horizon to the other. So it's pretty incredible. You can go to nasa.gov and look for spot the station and be able to find where your local sighting opportunities are. And you'll see it here because I have some amazing photos I took of New York while flying over during the daytime. And I've seen it at night. So you'll get some great views even here in the city because it's so bright. Yeah, so the International Space Station is what we've mostly been focused on. Uh, so it's truly an international collaboration. It's the only scientific laboratory that's 250 miles over our head. So we talked about it taking six minutes to go over. It's traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, and it takes only 90 minutes to go around the Earth. So you're seeing 16 sunrises and sunsets while you're up there. Yep. So that's pretty incredible. Five space agencies have helped us build this, representing 15 countries. So we've got NASA, Canadians, Russians, Japanese, and the European Space Agency. So as I mentioned, truly an international collaboration. We've launched the first component way back in 1998. So before any of the kids were born in this room, and we've had people living there since the year 2000. So this November, I believe, we're getting ready to celebrate 20 years of continuous human presence in space. So that means we've always had, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Yeah. We've always had at least two people living and working in space, which is pretty incredible. Pretty remarkable. So the area where the astronauts do a lot of their work and their science and they live is this habitable volume, and it's about the size of a five-bedroom house. Right. So how did it feel living with five of your closest friends in a five-bedroom house for 197 days? It, it, it's, it's quite roomy. People always ask, did you get claustrophobic? And I said, never. Um, a, we, we had ample opportunities to, to find privacy when we needed it. Looking at the Earth provided the outside views you needed. And we all lived, we all had our own little sleeping compartment, which is about the size of a large refrigerator, <laughs> which doesn't sound terribly comfortable. <laughs> but you don't need a bed, you don't need any furniture because you're floating. All you needed was a sleeping bag up against the wall and a computer to send emails or contact home. And uh, you need some place that's quiet, private, can get dark so you can sleep. And so it was a very comfortable time, and I never felt claustrophobic 197 days. It was a very comfortable place to live and work. That's great. So if you might have recently heard, Christina Cook just returned from the space station, space station having spent 328 days up there. So she's got the longest endurance record for a woman, but that's pretty incredible. Would you have, so at, at 200 days, were you ready to come home or could you have oh, spent? Oh, I was with Drew, so I was, yeah. No, 200 days, it was, I was, uh, Drew Morgan is actually up there now. He's on an extended stay duration. Yep. I, I was, of course I was ready to come home, but I wasn't. I didn't have to come right, home. Right. Uh, it, was a, it was a comfortable place to live and work. So let's see. So including the solar arrays, which is how the space station generates its power, it's the size of a football field, including the end zones. So it is a very, very big space station. Right now we have three people living and working there. We mentioned we've got Drew Morgan, Jessica Meir, two NASA astronauts. And we have Oleg. Remind me of Oleg's last name. OK, we have a Russian cosmonaut, Oleg, who's up there right now. So we've got three people living on the space station. I think now we're going to watch videos of how we build no. the ISS. I'll, I'll get this right one of these days. OK, this next video, we'll eventually get to, to Ricky's launch videos. So this next video is showing how we built the space station. So as I mentioned, we launched the first piece back in 1998. 
So each of these new elements that you see coming up represent one of 37 space shuttle missions that it took to assemble the space station. So each new mission came up, it would bring the new piece of the space station up in the space shuttle's payload bay, and then we would use the robotic arm to grab that piece, move it over to the space station, and then do a series of spacewalks to be able to attach the pieces together to mate electrical lines or fluid lines or different things like that. So it's taken over 230 spacewalks for us to be able to complete the space station. And it's important to remember that all of these components were built all around the world by different countries, different cultures, different languages, different measuring systems, and uh, assembled for the first time, put together for the first time in, uh, in low Earth orbit. Yeah, in space, which in is space. It's pretty incredible. So Ricky, we're almost to your mission. Oh yes. We're getting this, close. Well, we're getting close. We're up getting to 2007. Close. But you can see there's a lot of reconfiguration going on. They'd get it in one position, say, okay, now we got to get ready for the next piece. And we'd actually move uh, one component, move it to another location to get us in a better posture for what was coming. There it is, the there single most go. important piece ever flown to the International Space Station, <laughs> the S6 Truss, which provided enough power that when, when I flew, there were three USOs, through three crew members on the International Space Station. And after we left, we had enough power to go to a crew of six which then enabled us to implement the really robust science program we have on the space station, because we went up there to do science. Yep, yep. That's, the, that's the whole reason we're up there, is to learn more about our universe, to learn more about ourselves, to learn more about the Earth. Uh, you know, that's the whole reason that we're doing the space station. So Ricky mentioned, you know, we're pretty much done with the space station around 2011 when we retired the space shuttle. We had launched all the major components, but we have done a series of spacewalks to get the space station ready for what's coming next, and that is the commercial crew program. So later this year, from Kennedy Space Center, we'll be launching Boeing's CST-100 and uh, SpaceX's Crew Dragon mission. And so that's a really exciting time for us because they will be launching NASA astronauts from U.S. soil again. So since we retired the space shuttle, we've been relying on our Russian counterparts to launch our astronauts into space. So it's really exciting that we're going to be launching from Kennedy Space Center once again. So we had to install some new docking adapters to be able to accommodate that. So finally, the space shuttle launch. Yeah, this is one way, and the reason we're able to carry so much those big components is the payload bay. Uh, that's the bulk. Of, excuse me, the bulk of the space shuttle had a payload bay which could carry. Like our component was about the size of a bus and weighed 16 tons, so we could carry something that big and seven astronauts to low Earth orbit. This is a wild ride. The main engine's light. The whole vehicle pitches forward. It kind of points back to where you're going. The solid rocket motors launch, and you jump off the Earth. You don't know where you're going. You hope you're going in the right direction, but you, the only thing you know is you're going somewhere in a hurry. And it's about eight and a half minutes of just pure acceleration. It's a, the best roller coaster ride ever. I like roller coasters. And, uh, and uh, it was absolutely amazing experience. Where those, the two big plumes coming out of the back are the solid rocket motors. They burned up. They, were, they expended all their fuel in about the first two and a half minutes. And they would fall back to Earth. And then the three points of light you can see there are the, the space shuttle main engines. The ride gets really smooth. And you're just going faster and faster until all the liquid oxygen and hydrogen, that's Sandy, we're her ride home. That's why she's so excited. Because she's fully convinced now we're coming to get her. But that big orange tank is full of liquid oxygen and hydrogen, which provides the propellant. And the space shuttle flies away, eight and a half minutes. We're 240 miles above the Earth, going about 17,000 miles an hour. So compare that to your launch in 2018 when you rode on a Russian rocket. Yeah, you can see it's a lot smaller. It does, have, it does not have the payload capability and can only carry three people. But it is still the same principle, a controlled explosion that you're sitting on top of that's going to get you from sitting still to traveling 17,000 miles an hour in a little over eight and a half minutes. And we actually launched from the same launch pad as Yuri Gagarin. The name ring a bell? Yeah, the first, first human to go to space. So it's rich with tradition. Um, the three of us, it was a, just a really exhilarating time. Allison actually was, I was one of my guests to launch. She came out there and watched. Could you read? Create what you were thinking this no, moment in time. It was, so it was incredible. So I had, you know, I had trained, I had trained Ricky, and Ricky said he launched with Drew Feustel, who the, the the space shuttle mission that I worked STS-134 in 2011. 
Drew was one of our spacewalking crew members. So I knew bro both Drew and Ricky very well. And so when I was lucky enough to be invited to head over to, to Baikonur, Kazakhstan to watch them launch, I was beside myself. Because here I was not only experiencing a rocket launch, how cool is that, but two of my closest friends are on top of that controlled explosion. Yeah. So needless to say, I was pretty emotional when I saw them, saw them finally launch. <laughs> All right, so now we talked a lot about spacewalking. So now I think we have a couple of videos that we can watch where Ricky did a great job of explaining how spacewalks work. So this was for your year of education? Year of education on station. Uh, while I was up there, uh, by a coincidence of manifest, Joe Acaba, who's also a former teacher, flew six months prior to me. He went home about two, three weeks later. I flew back up and replaced him. So for a year, we had two folks who had been classroom teachers. So NASA had a year in education this station. There are some great, for, for questions you might have about the space station, like how do we sleep, how do we get water, how do we make power, um, you just, about any question you can ask, you can look at demonstrations, uh, look it up on YouTube, and we'll be providing lessons for you uh, on YouTube. But one of the things we talked about was how do you do a spacewalk, and so this video was actually shot on the International Space Station in the Quest airlock a few weeks before we were getting yeah. ready to do an EVA. Yeah, and so I'm gonna stop you real quick. So we talked about water on the space station. Does anyone know how they make the drinking water on the space station? Do you know how to, you know how to make it. Do you know how, how they make it? Oh, okay, why? Why, okay. So how they, how they make water on the space station is they actually recycle the urine. So this, well, at first it seems a little daunting of a task to recycle urine into drinking water. This is definitely a technology that we need to develop in order for us to go back to the moon and onto Mars. So how did the, how did the water taste, Ricky? The water, we sample it. We, it tastes fine. And we actually send samples back. to It's cleaner than any municipal drinking water you can get on any, in any city on Earth. Uh, it's very, very pure. And it's really important for going to a further dis destinations beyond be like going to the moon or Mars. But it's also a critical technology for here on Earth. We've got a lot of places that are water stressed here on Earth, and being able to recycle everything we use is, that, is absolutely critical. Yeah, all right, let's see how this goes. Welcome to the Quest Airlock on the International Space Station. I know that guy. Me too. I'm a 56 flight engineer from NASA. Today we're gonna to talk about one of my favorite topics, extravehicular activity or EVA. Going out on an EVA or a spacewalk has been one of the most amazing experiences of my life but it's also one of the most complicated and dangerous things we do during it. human space flight. <laughs> that There's was a lot true. of equipment to prepare and maintain, and we do months of training to make each EVA a success. If you think it sounds complicated, you should see all of it in action. Let's start with training and how we get ready for a spacewalk. Space is an extreme environment that presents many hazards. If we're gonna go outside the safety of the ISS, we have to be prepared. That's why EVAs are designed with safety as the utmost priority. We astronauts spend a lot of time in the classroom, just like you are now, learning about the hardware we'll be using and the specific parts of the space station we'll be working on. Then we get to go spend a lot of time training in NASA's giant pool, called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, or NDL. Since it's impossible to simulate microgravity on Earth, the next best option is water, 6.2 million gallons of it. It's a lot of water. The NDL is 40 feet deep, 202 feet in length, and 102 feet in width. A lot of room to have a full-scale working model of the ISS, which we need for practicing our EVA maneuvers and assigned tasks. We get suited up and weighted so that we're neutrally buoyant in the water, so we don't sink to the bottom and we don't float to the surface. It's a great way to simulate the microgravity we'll be experiencing. We do several dress rehearsals of the EVA before we launch. This gives us the opportunity to prepare for any anomalies that may occur. We spend at least five hours practicing the MBL for every one hour plan for the spacewalk. So we are very well prepared to execute the EVAs once we are in orbit. Once we are up in orbit, the EVA preparation continues. First, we must perform a pre-breathe protocol to displace the nitrogen in our tissues and help prevent a condition called decompression sickness. During pre-breathe, we breathe 100% pure oxygen and do some light exercise to help purge the nitrogen from our bodies. During pre-breathe, we will also don our extravehicular mobility unit, or EMU. This is a fancy name for a spacesuit. The spacesuit is basically its own spacecraft shaped like a human, 
There is usually a red stripe on the leg of one astronaut, of work right but not the other, tall. so the ground can tell who is who. To ensure our safety at all times, we are always aware of our safety tethers and where we are in relation to our spacewalking buddy. Hey, buddy. There's a fellow crew member called the IB, the intervehicular crew, on the inside of the airlock, watching and communicating with us as the EVA progresses. We are also prepared for several contingencies should they occur. First, we are trained on the use of a jet pack that can be used to maneuver in the event of an emergency rescue. It's called a SAFER, or Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. The view during an EVA is magnificent. It's beautiful out there. It's also extremely dangerous, but our months of preparation and all of those dedicated people working on the ground, working around the clock, ensure we are safe as possible when we work outside the ISS. EVAs have allowed us to build and maintain the ISS, repair mission critical hardware, investigate malfunctions, install new hardware, and the view, unbelievable. <laughs> See you next time. All right, anything to add to this video? Do you want to roll the next one? Well, just that video, it takes about four hours to get prepped to go outside. And outside, you're outside for about six and a, six half, and a half hours. hours. And it's about another half hour to get back inside and get help to get out of your suit. So. Uh, that kind of gives you a view of what our day's like. Uh, next, we'd like to talk a little bit about, I think, the equipment. Right, and so we'll roll the next video. So we are standing in the Quest airlock, which is divided into two parts. We have the equipment lock, and we have the crew lock. This equipment lock has a hatch right here that closes, and the crew lock has another hatch. The EMU, or the extravehicular mobility unit, is our spacesuit. And it's divided roughly into two parts. We have the hard upper torso, which is almost like a turtle shell. Um, it's a hard fiberglass shell. And then we also have the lower torso assembly. These spacesuits are our own little spacecraft, and they have everything you need to keep you alive out in space for seven to eight hours, um, maybe even longer, uh, depending on how hard you're working. The only thing that they do not have, and they have radios, it has oxygen, it has carbon dioxide scrubbing, it has temperature control, it has everything you need, except for one thing, a restroom. And so when we get ready for our EVA, the <laughs> first thing we put on the morning, in the morning, is a, a diaper. And um, that's our first layer. Then over the diaper, we put on a pair of long johns, and that's to keep our arms and legs from getting scraped up. It also provides a little bit of wicking in case you're getting really hot and sweaty. The next layer is our liquid cooling garment. And the LCVG has little tubes running through it, which allow water to circulate with inside the LCVG to, uh, to provide cooling when we're outside working really hard. So we've got the diaper, we've got long johns, we got the LCBG, and then we're gonna wear our spacesuit. Seven layers from the bladder on the inside, which maintains, maintains pressure, and that's a rubberized bladder, all the way out to the white layer on the outside. The crew member inside the, the spacesuit is also wearing this, what we call a Snoopy cap. Um, it's a communications cap. We have a radio, so we can talk to not only to Houston, but we can talk to people on the space station and to each other. So we wear this communication cap inside the, inside the helmet. Also, a part, another component, <laughs> key component of the uh, of the EMU or spacesuit is the helmet. Uh, you can see the helmet has a, a gold visor, uh, which pr protects us from the the rays of the sun that we can bring down. Uh, it's pretty bright out there, and this gold visor uh, helps reflect the rays of the sun, so we can actually see and operate uh, in, in daylight. At nighttime, we can raise this visor up, gives us a clearer view, and additionally, we have helmet lights built into the helmet. On top of the helmet, we also have a television camera. So the ground is able to watch us while we work through these TV cameras. The work is really all done with hands. And um, so our gloves are really our most important piece of equipment in order for us to work outside. And one of the real challenges of a spacewalk is you have this heavy gloved hand, which is inflated. So it wants to stay like it's blown up like a balloon. But we walk by grabbing onto handrails and making our way along the ISS. So every time you move your hand, you're fighting against a, a balloon that wants to inflate. And then on top of that, all of our equipment is based on using your hands too. So after six and a half, seven hours of kind of fighting against this glove, it's a really long day and your hands are probably the thing that are most exhausted after, after seven hours out on an EVA. Well, we're going out to work. You probably saw me move uh, this mini workstation. 
The way we carry our tools is on a mini workstation, which is carried on the front. Every single tool we use is tethered to us. We do not want to accidentally create satellites. Our primary way of may, may remaining attached to the ISS, if we're not using our hands, are these waist tethers. And you can see they just have a big hook. They go around a rail or uh, anything else on the ISS and latch on. And it actually has a locking mechanism as well to hold us nice and tight. So we always, always want to have one of these attached if we're not holding on with our hands as well. The back of the EMU has our life support system. The life support system uh, contains all the equipment we need from a, from a UHF radio down to the oxygen tanks that provide primary oxygen. One of the challenges inside the sealed environment, it's very easy to carry our own oxygen with us, but we generate a lot of carbon dioxide, particularly when we're out there working very hard. So to combat that, to deal with that, we have these canisters called uh, Medox canisters, which are just silver oxide. They are carried in the backpack uh, along with a very large battery, which provides all the electricity for us. I don't have a battery here to show you today because we're in the process of charging them. We're about a month out from doing a spacewalk and we've already started getting ready for that. So this Maddox canister is, about able to, is able to remove about uh, seven to eight hours of carbon dioxide that a human can generate inside the spacesuit. EVAs have allowed us to build and maintain the ISS, repair mission critical hardware, investigate malfunctions, install new hardware, and the view, unbelievable. See you next time. All right, nicely done, Ricky. Those are great videos. And like he mentioned, you can go to, uh, to YouTube and find those demonstrations because they're great videos either to show your friends or to have your teacher show in school. So we talked a little bit about how long it takes to get ready for a spacewalk. So here is what the timeline looks like. So these are, let's see, we've got, if you guys are up to speed on the NASA news, we had our first all-female spacewalk recently. So we sent out Jessica and Christina. So here's an example of what their day looks like. So Luca and Drew helped them. They'll wake up at about 6 a.m. Then they spend the next hours, four hours, getting ready, putting on their spacesuit, doing that pre-breathe protocol that we talked about, talked about so you don't get decompression sickness. So they don't actually start their spacewalk until about noon. And then they're outside for six and a half, sometimes up to eight hours. And then it takes a while to get out. So they're going to bed pretty late by the end of the day. So you can imagine how tired you are if you, you wake up at six and you don't actually start your work day until noon. It's a very long day. So let's see, so these are the girls. Um, so they breathe pure oxygen through these masks and that's how we achieve that denitrogenization of the blood. So you're getting the nitrogen out. And then once they're in the suit, they're ready to start their spacewalks. So you might wonder, what's going on on the ground? Well, we've got these four astronauts working on getting ready uh, to, to go out into space. As I mentioned, we've got a whole team here on the ground. And this is an example of some of the work that I've been doing as a flight director. So just a week ago, we launched an unmanned cargo resupply mission to the space station. It was built by the Northrop Grumman Corporation, so NG-13. This was the 13th one of these missions that we've launched. So we called this NG-13. It launched just a week ago. And then bright and early Tuesday morning, it made its way up to the space station. And this was a mission I was in charge of. So you can see the vehicle right here. So once it approached close enough to the space station, I was then in charge of making sure we are keeping the astronauts safe and completing our objectives. So all the different flight controllers in this room, we've got different specialists, whether it's power or thermal or the external systems or the biomedical engineers are all constantly telling me what's going on so I have educated decision making. So then once you get the, uh, the unmanned spacecraft up to about eight meters from the space station, the astronauts on board, Drew Morgan in this case, used the robotic arm to grab onto the spacecraft. And then we took over on the ground, continued to maneuver the robotic arm so that it reached, so it was able to meet up with one of the docking ports. So and, uh, just to think about that, the spacecraft comes up to the International Space Station. It has thousands of pounds of cargo worth tens of millions of dollars. They're flying alongside each other at over 17,000 miles an hour. And you have one person who's responsible for flying the hand controllers to go out and grab it. And so it's not hard, but it's nerve wracking. It's probably one of the more nerve wracking things you do because it's just you flying the arm, going out to grab a spaceship that is flying alongside the ISS. Yeah, and full of, as you mentioned, full of science, full of things like fresh 
food. I know this this mission we had some cheese, which was really exciting. Hopefully ice cream. Because oh yeah, ice cream. Because you you get used to kind of eating the same thing maybe over and over again when you're in space. I'm not sure you get used to it, but you definitely do it over and over again. <laughs> so what's what's one of your favorite foods that you ate while you were up there? Oh well, I found that I had to do some creative stuff. So uh, there was a chicken and peanut sauce. Sounds pretty good, except for some reason it had no peanut taste in it. So I found like two gigantic scoops of peanut butter mixed in with this chicken and peanut sauce with rice. Actually turned it out turned, out, turned out pretty tasty. Yeah. Sh sriracha sauce um, goes Must on, have. goes well on just about everything. Uh, they do have a dehydrated hamburger that's folded in half. It's the patty. You add water and you heat it up. And the funny thing about it, so it's. It has grill marks on it. Oh, yeah. I've what? eaten one of them at the food lab, yep. But there's no way that thing was actually cooked on a grill. So I'm wondering, like, did someone go with a Sharpie and put the <laughs> grill marks on? Because it, so, But it, it looked appealing. And uh, we don't have bread, or so we would eat the bread or buns or anything that we could, could liberate crumbs, because you don't want crumbs floating around. You get them in your eyes. And uh, so that's eaten on a, uh, a patty. Uh, with, I mean, the patty, you put it on a uh, tortilla. And then there's this cheese, when we didn't have fresh cheese, that comes in a, like a little packet, like a ketchup packet. Oh, oh. And you could squeeze this cheese-like mm. thing. It wasn't really cheese. I'm not quite sure it was, <laughs> what it was. And, uh, and then put some sriracha sauce on or Tabasco sauce or anything for flavor. Um, at some point, they decided this food, about five, six years ago, the food had too much salt in it. So they took all the salt out. But that, that was really the only flavor a lot of the food had. So we have a lot of condiments that get used regularly to add flavor to the food. Well, it sounds like you're really selling this whole astronaut gig. Do you guys still want hey, to be an astronaut? <laughs> it's, a, it's a camping trip. And exactly. so the food's hot, it's plentiful, and the views are nice. Yes. So the one other thing I wanted to point out about this mission is we name each of our spacecraft after someone who's made a large contribution to, to, uh, to space. And so this is Air Force Major Robert Henry Lawrence Jr. He was the first African-American astronaut selected back in 1967. And unfortunately, tragically, he died in a plane crash just a few months after being selected. So he never got a chance to, f to fly up into space. But we named the NG-13 mission in his honor to thank him for his service. So that's pretty cool. All right, so now we've got a couple pictures of Ricky out making the magic happen doing a spacewalk. So Ricky, can you talk a little bit about the differences and how we train on the ground versus what you experienced out in space? The training's awesome. I mean, Allison and her team, and she doesn't do it anymore, but they, they've got this down to a science. Uh, and then having guys like Mike and veteran astronauts being a part of it as well. By the time you're ready for a spacewalk, you're just about ready for everything. The one thing it's really hard to simulate is what it's like to work in microgravity. Um, the fact that you have something, if you have a tether attached to you, right, and I let it go, what's it happen here? It just hangs down on my side. And you know where it is. And you know where it is. If it's not attached to something, it is floating in every possible direction. Bonking you, can you in imagine, the visor. Hitting you in the head, and you can imagine how many tethers we have. We're carrying tools out. So just and then your your own your own body there's times like you know exactly where you are on the space station you start working on something you look down to get something and your body starts to rotate a little bit and you could just be off just a little bit and get completely lost on the space station because your picture you, you go to look back at the space station like well where to go <laughs> where and am it's I? just a question you've just turned a little bit and that you cannot simulate it's a, it's a very strange and disorienting place to work um, and it just takes some getting used to that's one thing uh, the second thing is, like, our planet is the ultimate distraction. <laughs> we get a lot of work done at night because we pass through night a lot. And there's just not a lot to see. You see a few thunderstorms maybe. If you're lucky, maybe the, the aurora. But it's, you know, you're, you're at night. You just got, you got your headlamps. And you're kind of working where the head, your headlamps are lighting up your hands. And you can get a lot of work done. Then the sun comes up. And then, oh my gosh, look at this mm. planet beneath me, passing beneath my feet. So how do you simulate that? We do it in a VR lab, but it's just not the same. Yeah. The last thing that I really wasn't prepared for was this ride. Uh, that's me on the end of the robotic arm. Um, you're, you can see I'm in a foot restraint. Alice, you point to the APFR there. I'm sorry. You, my feet are kind of in these hooks that I, I climbed into, and I'm tethered down to this thing. But because my spacesuit's so bulky, I can't see my feet. And the only thing I can see all around me is space. 
And at some point, you know, you, you, get on the, you climb into the robotic arm and you're holding onto the space station and your friend inside is flying the robotic arm with hand controllers and they start backing you away. Pretty soon you have to let go. And just that, that initial letting go and not being able to see where you're attached, was, it was a little bit overwhelming. People say, what were you thinking? And I said, well, for the entire time I was thinking, I hope my feet don't come out, I hope my feet don't come out, I hope my feet don't come out. Um, but it is absolutely remarkable, because all of a sudden you'll be hanging upside down like a bat with the space station in front of you, and the Earth over your head, and then they'll fly in another direction, and then the Earth set your feet. And I remember one pass in particular at my last EVA. We're flying over Europe to, into North Africa. The sun's going down. I'm flying across the Mediterranean just and I can't, the space station's at my back. It's just me in space on this robotic arm watching the sunset and the Sahara come up in front of me. And wow. it's something, an image I'll never yeah. forget. You That's can't train great. that. As good as you are training, you can't prepare <laughs> you, you us for can't that. You can't train everything. You'll notice right. here I'm waving uh, to my buddy Drew, but I'm still holding on to a handhold because I'm still <laughs> scared to death I'm going to float away. All right, so I think, uh, I think that about wraps up the presentation we had for you. This is another picture kind of showing the team that it takes. This was from the final flight of Space Shuttle Endeavor back in 2011, STS-134. I'm hiding back there somewhere in the pink shirt. So that's just an example of one of the three teams, because since we're supporting 24-7, we have three teams that do nine-hour shifts and rotate through. So this was just one of the, the teams that it took to make that Space Shuttle uh, mission a success. So that was kind of one of the main points that we wanted to get across today is that, you know, working at NASA, it is truly a team sport, that it takes lots of collaboration between folks around the world to make us successful and lots of teams uh, supporting ultimately the astronauts in space. So with that, thank you guys so much for your yeah, attention thanks. today. Yeah, and yeah, I think we have a microphone. Alan has a microphone, so if folks have questions, go ahead and raise your hand and we can get that microphone to you. What happens if the, the like the hook that you attach to the rails, what happens if you, if it breaks off? Well, we usually have two things going for us. We usually have this safety tether, which is attached to the space suit, and then I got it backwards, don't I? This is attached to this bat. My teacher never taught me that. No, that's attached to your Oh, I did have it right. OK, thank you. Well, there's usually a big hook. Good grief. I got this thing. I'm getting confused. All right, so we got attached here. This is attached to a handrail. And that's one way we're attached. The second way is we have this waist tether, which is also attached to our spacesuit. And if we're working in a location, we have both. And then a third thing we can do is hold on with our hand. So in order for you to really float away, you would have to have either not hooked yourself up or this broke, which we inspect them pretty regularly. We don't think they're going to break. But you don't have yourself hooked up there, and you're doing something, you get distracted, and you start to float away. Well, this thing will pay out about what, 55 feet, and then it's going to start to retract you back to the ISS. But say that even that broke. So now we've got three things that have happened bad, right? You forgot to hook yourself up, you let go, and you float it away, and this breaks. Well, built into the, the backpack of the spacesuit is a, 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 some tanks of nitrogen, and they're, they're fuel for a little tiny, so you can turn yourself into a little tiny spaceship. There's a hand controller buried back there. You can deploy it, and you can fly yourself back to the space station with these little puffs of nitrogen to kind of give you a push back to the ISS. And we actually have to demonstrate in a virtual reality setting that we can do that before Allison would let us go fly. Yep. So the astronauts are very safe. All right, what other questions do we have? What if the International Space Station loses gas? All of what if it loses so if it, gas? So we have a leak? So I think you mean like if it starts to lose air, like air? Like when it starts to leak. Well, we actually train for that. That's one of three emergencies that we get trained for. We get trained in case there's a fire. We get trained in case there's a toxic gas release. And we get trained in case there's a, a leak. And so those three things, we have to memorize what we're going to do. So if the alarm sounds, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. 
You know, if you could be sound asleep, if that alarm goes, there's certain things you have to do without even thinking about them. So we train that over and over and over again. We get ourselves safe, and then we start trying to figure out where the leak is. And if we can find the leak, we might be able to repair it. Mm -hmm. And when I was on the space station, we had a small leak uh, that we found out about. And we actually were able to, we got ready to go, we got ourselves safe, we made sure we knew our spaceship wasn't leaking, like our, our ride home was safe. But we actually found that uh, one, of the, one of the spaceships was the ride home had a small hole in it, and we actually found it and repaired it. So we, we made ourselves safe. But those, we train emergencies so we don't have to think about them, we just act. Yep. And then once we get to a place where we know we're safe, then we can start solving the problem. Yeah, good question. And that's important for, for, your, for Allison, too, that we, they know what we're doing. If the alarm sounds, they know where they're going to find us because yep. we've we memorized. So it's really important for the ground to know what's happening because we're not even going to have time to tell them sometimes. Yep. And they just want us to be predictable. And we predict by memorizing. And with the, for those three things, we can do, like, do, it, yep. do it over and over again. Yes? How, how do you tell if it's day or night in space? If there's a window, you can look outside. But in most of the places where we work, there is not a window. So if we can actually go back, oh, oh. forward one. Yeah, 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 I'm trying. There, there we, we go. go. You see the bands up at the very top? What do you think the white means? Day and the dark, night. So a lot of times, that's the only way we know because we don't have any windows where we're working. Might be the first time I've ever been asked that question about that. How is it cold at space even though the whole sun is in space? Yeah, how does it get cold in space even though the sun's there, right? There's no clouds blocking it. Well, when you're in the sun, it can be a couple hundred degrees outside. It's pretty warm. And that's one of the reasons we have this liquid cooling garment, because we can start to get really hot. But we're in the shade, or it's nighttime, it can be minus 200 degrees. So we have these extreme temperature mm -hmm. ranges that that's why we have to wear the spacesuit and have the ability to control the temperature of our spacesuit. Inside, if we start to get too hot or too cold, we call down to the ground and say, And Houston hey, will fix it. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's getting a little warm in here at night. Can you set the air conditioner a little bit stronger? So they'll push some buttons, make yep. the magic happen, and they'll adjust the temperature for us. What if you land in the Arctic when you go back home to Earth? In a, we had survival suits. Uh, so we actually had to, as part of our training, go into the woods in Russia in the middle of winter and demonstrate that we can get our survival suits on inside of our Soyuz capsule, make our way out in the snow, build a shelter, build a fire, and get ourselves safe. There's some, there's some survival equipment in the, uh, in the Soyuz that goes along with us. And one of those is a big, heavy, warm suit. But it's not ideal. I, the land in the Arctic in winter would not be, no, or even not in fun, the summer. Not fun. Yeah. I like your space station, by the way. Nice yeah. work. How do you know when to sleep? I tell him when to yes. sleep. No. <laughs> <laughs> so just like Ricky mentioned, you know, this, this timeline kind of runs their day. So you've got your day-night cycles. You know what time of day it is. And as the, as the astronauts are working through their day, there'll be a red line that shows the current time. And that red line just slowly makes its way across the day. And so it shows them, hey, by about 7.30 PM, it's time to start thinking about making some dinner, maybe calling home to your friends if you want to. And then you know by uh, 11, let's see, to 8, 9, 10, 11.30, Maybe you're going to bed. I don't know. Did you find yourself being a night owl, staying up late on the space well, station? Well, when your parents tell you to go to bed, do you always go right to sleep? No, neither did we. Um, <laughs> some people stayed up later. Some people. It also would tell us to wake up. Yeah, I'd tell so, you to wake up at, at 6 in the morning. 6 o'clock, but our first thing was usually like a, a, a telephone, I mean, a conference over the radio is around 7. So if sometimes you woke up at 10 till 7 and still called in. <laughs> It was really up to you. These are more guidelines, guidelines. Uh, for, for the crew. But some people need more sleep than others. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you're, you know, you're not as tired. And you'll stay up a little bit later. But uh, you still got to be up and get, get up and go to work the next day. So, right. And be able to respond to an emergency. And, and so how we know when the astronauts are asleep or when they wake up is we actually have the space station is sending a bunch of data to us on the ground, right? So we're always looking at different things on the space station. The toilet is a pretty ingenious yeah. mechanism, but it requires power for it to work. 
And so we're able to monitor the current draw. So we can tell when it's flatlined, the astronauts are asleep, and then we see it spike up, that means someone's using the toilet. And then we know at least one person on the space station is awake. So that's how we're able to kind of spy on the astronauts from the ground. They, they also get information about where the space station is in space, and if we're up and active, we're making the space station move a little bit. And so Ever some, so slightly yeah, where we can detect they it. Can, I know one of the stories was the, uh, the ADCO, which is the attitude control person, was seeing the space station kind of doing this weird rhythmic bobbing. And uh, it was just one of the crew members had their feet under handrail, was just kind of bouncing up and down as they were talking. And oh, they geez. did it habitually. And finally, the flight that, And that was enough to, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that they were able to figure What's out. What's going someone, on? What is going on? Are one of you guys bouncing up and down? Oh, yeah, it's so-and-so <laughs> when they're watching TV. Interesting. All right. We have time. Our last two questions. One, okay. two. OK. Do people litter in space? Do people live? Do people litter in space? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. So like I mentioned, we've for 20 years now, we've had at least two people living in space. And they no, typically, no, no. oh, litter. sorry, low litter. litter. Oh, yes, not that too. In, not intentionally. Right. Sometimes we create, uh, sometimes we do it on purpose. Uh, like I, on my first spacewalk, I took off a cover. And this was really cool because I was out at the very end of the space station. And I counted three, two, one, and through this thing. And to see this cloth billowing as it heads toward the Earth's atmosphere and into night. It was just so cool. And then the state, NASA was actually tracking it. So it was a satellite that stayed in orbit for about 30 days that I launched oh, wow. personally by doing this. Yeah. Uh, so that's an example of litter. Another example of litter might be, so this tool, like I, either the hook comes undone or I forget to hook it or something happens and it goes floating off and the flight director gets really mad at me and I feel really dumb for a long time. But that's another type of litter and all of these things we're worried about coming back and hitting the space station. Right. Um, and the, the third type is um, uh, just stuff we actually pack into a cargo vehicle as trash, and we send that cargo ve vehicle up and out into space. But that cargo vehicle will then come into the Earth's atmosphere and burn up, just like almost all the trash we generate, it's going to burn up in Earth's atmosphere. So my satellite lasted for about 30 days. Something heavier like this will last a long time and make people really nervous, but it will eventually come back to, to Earth. And the cargo vehicles, we intentionally burn them up in the Earth's atmosphere. All right, it last will, question. You'll see it flying in the sky, yep. Yeah. What's your question? What if the space station breaks? What if the space station breaks? Well, we hope it doesn't break. But that's why, you know, so like I said, part of my job is to keep the astronauts safe, and they're trained to handle it when things break. And then we all work together as a team to figure out how to fix. Once we ensure okay, the astronauts are, their immediate safety is, is OK, we'll figure out how to work as a team to fix the space station. Yeah, Allison would be response. Maybe she would be assigned. Um, they would might ask us, do we, do we know what happened? Is there anything we can provide to them? And if we'll give them anything we can give to them in terms of information. But sometimes we don't have any idea what happened, like if a piece of hardware broke. And Allison and a team would be working pretty much around the clock, mm -hmm. depending on how important that piece of, of equipment was, to come up with a plan for us to go fix it. So you'd have a team on the ground doing all the really hard work, and then eventually they would put it on our schedule and say, OK, it's time for you guys to go fix it. Here's the tools you need, and here's how you're going to do it. All right, guys. Well, hey, thank you so our, much. Thank, thank you. you all right, thank you.
All right. Hey, if you're still with us, uh, they are clearing out. Of course, we went to the, the Be Right Back screen, the lost the signal screen there for a second. Um, let me know if you can hear me now. Are we still 5x5 five five here? Uh, EJ, are we still good? I think we are still good. The chat says that we're good. Uh, let me know if we're 5x5. Five five. Uh, they are sort of packing up and stuff. The theater sort of emptying out. But again, uh, that was a presentation. Right? Uh, we got a little bit of chance at the beginning to talk with Ricky Arnold, and then Allison came over and joined Ricky, and they did that presentation. And then they're sort of, uh, they're sort of, they have a huge amount of kids crowded around them down there, and they're handing them space gloves and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah it's it's a bit dark. We know that we didn't turn on a light back. Oh, we made that light. Oh, hand, somebody hand us a light. Look, <laughs> this is how the production goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> Watch. Ha! You like that? Ew. How about them apples? This is where <laughs> so uh, we like we like to share that live stream with you all. Again, it's a different sort of thing. If you're watching on the NASA Space Flight YouTube channel, um, I know that that's not a rocket launch, right? That's not Chris G standing next to the pad. Uh, we come out here, me with my Kerbal streams, and then EJ with his his Kerbal streams on Twitch. We come out and we do this uh, outreach for kids. We've been coming to the Intrepid Museum here in New York City for five years now, and uh, this is a cool thing to be able to share the astronaut presentation, sit down and chat with them. We've actually done some mobile interviews where we walk around the hangar deck, and they have all sorts of learning partners for kids. Uh, we talked with Cornell earlier and they had some little robots. There was a Robo Fun company that also had little Lego type robots for the kids. Um, Hootie Set One from New York is there. There's just all sorts of places, uh, local, I guess, organizations. Robo Fun. Robo Fun. Yeah, exactly. There's just all sorts of organizations that, that bring out a little table, they have a little booth, they have some hands-on stuff for the kids to see, and uh, that's other stuff that we've done here. EJ was walking around the flight deck earlier as well. That's about the restoration hangar. Yeah, you went to the restoration oh, hangar? Oh yeah, they, uh, they opened up the helicopters for us, we got to see the engines and everything. Yeah. Yes. They're complicated. It's kind of, the helicopters it's are complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated, right? Um, so, so this is a thing that we've been doing out here at the museum for five years, coming out on a regular basis. There's all sorts of talks and presentations. I'll fly into town. EJ will come down, and we just we share these on the live stream. And we thought that this might be something to see if uh, NASA space flight viewers were interested in. So getting 20 minutes to sit down with an astronaut and literally just chat. I mean, it's not like an interview. We're not passing a mic back and forth. It's, it's really just sitting down and chatting. And uh, that's a really unique opportunity, and I'm glad that we were all able to ask some questions and stuff like that. Let me make sure. I'm going to check the status again right quick. Rick is a master of communicating to kids and people. Nice. He's Excellent. a teacher. Yeah, he was a teacher originally. Teacher. You're right. He was a, a teacher, teacher originally. for everything. That explains why he's good with kids. Very... Very good at communicating. Excellent. Squall, thank you for saying that. So I'm going to do this really quickly. Um, what do you all think, right? We don't have 10,000 people watching or anything, but uh, was this something that was interesting? Is this the sort of thing that, that you think is interesting to see, or do you just want to stick with rocket videos, don't waste my time with astronauts? Sort of a loaded question. It's more for the NSF guys, right? Because I'm pretty sure yeah. I'm pretty sure my crew. I'm pretty sure like, you're sure. Like, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> my man. Uh, thanks to the team and the kids. I, I made the joke that the kids sometimes ask better questions than reporters at press conferences. Facts. Like, more of a comment than a question, really. But uh, three weeks ago, since we're here for this United Launch Alliance mission, SpaceX was doing this. Like, really? Come on. <laughs> That's the space light. Like, Chris is probably like, oh my gosh, can, can we turn them off? <laughs> <laughs> so glad you saw this on Twitter. Thanks everybody who put it together. Thank you, T Storms. Dap Dude 5x5. Thanks for sharing the great presentation, Squall. Hey, we're, we're happy to share this sort of stuff with you. <laughs> I'm not reading that out loud. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't. I know, I know. Not a good idea. <laughs> I said so that they would wonder what we were talking about. Thanks, Josh. Hey, Joseph, how's it going, man? Thanks for setting this up. No problem. There's, there's NASA space flight proper. Um, but again, I know this isn't the normal sort of thing, it's not a rocket launch, but we thought it might be interesting to share. Um, what I'm going to do here now, I am going to go back to the loss of signal screen, right? And I'm going to go down and see, Allison's super busy, I'm going to see if we can get Allison to come and sit down with us for a couple minutes. I know there are a lot of great questions, and we didn't really get a chance to ask Allison any questions, right? So we got, we got Ricky, we chatted with Ricky for 20 minutes, let me see if Allison would have a couple minutes to come and sit down to do a Q&A. So, we're going to go to the BRI back screen, the, the loss of signal screen, just expect the spinning logo or, or the logo on the screen, and uh, I'll be back in just a few minutes to tell you if we'll be able to check with Allison or not. So y'all hang in there, we'll be right back.
All right, so we're going to start this off with a status check again. We've plugged in wires and stuff, so let us know on both streams. Uh, are you able to hear us? Are we five by five? Can you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> We've got uh, Allison Bollinger. 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 Like you're going bowling. Like you're going bowling. bowling. Thank you. Bollinger. Yes. <laughs> Who's got a couple minutes to answer? She's super busy, but uh, we brought some props. To I'm not toys. I can't say toys. Can't say toys. Yeah. Because we, we brought some uh, some of the props from the table over there. So let me know that we're good here, y'all. And after you tell us that we're good, 408 audio's good. EJ, we good? We are good over we're there. Good. We are this good. We're good. Like the viewers Ready are our production launch. team. Go Ready? for launch. That's the flight director talking. <laughs> so, the, Allison, thanks for sitting down. down with us. No problem. Um, we had so many good questions that were coming through chat, and we're here. The kids are the kids are asking really good questions. Lots of great questions. It, it gives me hope. The future is bright. It is. Yeah, the the future is bright. Good questions. Yeah. 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 Um, and so we we had people asking here that we didn't get to ask. We okay. thought maybe a couple minutes. Sure. Um, Here's a good question that I saw come through chat. You're the flight director, right? Yes. You are a, a the flight director, a flight director. Ah, uh, flight director. How yes. does how does your day work? Like, do you get in? It's launch day, and it's ten hours before the launch. Are you in there ten hours before launch prepping, or do you show up in ten minutes? You're like, all right, I'm in charge here. Now let's get this party started. Like, when? How far in advance are you like on the scene for the launch? So that's a good question. So so right now, I'm not actually working launches. Gotcha. Because, so for example, the mission that I talked about working, the North of Bremen NG-13 mission. Right. The guys out at, launched out of Wallops Island, Virginia. And so those, the guys, the Northrop guys, the Antares guys, they were responsible for launch and everything like that. Gotcha. So I was actually... Um, so we support 24-7. Right. So I was signed up, coincidentally scheduled to work the overnight shift, so the 11.30 p.m. to 8.30 a.m. shift. Right. A couple days before launch. So I had been working all that. So I'm, the launch time, I think, was finally... Oh, that's right. The launch time... Oh, the, I was at three, Wallops. Three, two, one. The launch was at 3.21, which we thought was pretty cool <laughs> timing that the launch was scheduled for that time. So that was normally my sleeping period. Uh, so truthfully, for the launch, I set my alarm, woke up, watched the launch, saw yep. that we got successfully to orbit, went back to bed because I had to go to work that night. Um, so my real responsibility comes the day of rendezvous. Okay. So it took... So we launched on Saturday... Um, or did we launch on Sunday? We launched on Sunday, regardless. It was originally we, a got, Sunday, and then it slipped all the way to the following Friday, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, no, then we slipped on Friday, Saturday. We there launched you go. on Saturday. We rendezvoused to the space station Tuesday morning. Gotcha. So my real responsibility happens once you get within a couple hundred kilometers of the space station. That's gotcha. when I have authority, ultimate authority, right. of what I need to do to keep the vehicle safe, to keep the crew safe. So at that in, at that point, you're in charge of the space station, you're in charge of the Cygnus operator, right. like you're in charge right. of the whole shooting yes. match. Yes, and we have a whole team, there's a whole North of Grumman flight control team sure. that's supporting in Dulles, and so that we're coordinating with them, because they truthfully know their spacecraft better right, than we right. do, because they, they built it, designed it, and all those things. Launched but, it, they got it there. Yeah, like. we do have multiple, um, we call it go, go no goes, right. right, all along the way. So we have a flight rule that's providing the ultimate guidance about you need to make sure the ISS systems are all ready to go. You need to make sure the Cygnus systems are all ready to go. So I'm pulling the team, right. just like you would for a launch, to make sure everybody's go, okay, it's like a, like GC, a Topo, like ADCO, Spartan, Ethos, Pluto, ISO, Ops Plan, <laughs> BME, OSO, She's got OSO this memorized. Met, Robo, VVO, ICE, all the, I got to make sure all those people are good to go, and, and we're doing that periodically throughout the day. So gotcha. some of the bigger ones come when you're 250 meters out from space station, when you're 30 meters out from space station, and then when you arrive at the capture point about eight meters from space station, you yep. give the final go for capture, and that's gotcha. when the astronauts are released to Grab to it with the arm yeah, and then plug it into the station. And it. Okay. But right, so so my my responsibility is kind of geared up those couple hours before capture. Gotcha. And I guess I guess that makes sense because we're not launching humans from right. American soil right now. Not right? yet. Not we yet. Will soon enough. But soon. So here's a question for me: Is that a different type of training? Like, oh yes. Have yes. you trained? Do you train for space station operations flight director? Then you train for human launch flight yep. director. You train yep. for EVA EVA flight director? Question mark. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. 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 So these. Are yeah, no, that's exactly. So I was selected in 2018, right? Yep. There was a class of six of us. It took us about a year worth of training. So we took a lot of the same classes the astronauts took to get smart on the out, inside, outside of the space station. Yep. We did a handful of simulations where you're in mission control, you're flying a simulated space station, and right. they throw the kitchen sink at you. They break everything to see how the team responds. <laughs> Somebody needs that simulation. 
where there is actually a kitchen sink that's that like debris in space, <laughs> oh, no. and they throw the kitchen sink at the space that's station, and they get a, a big a big hole in the solar array. Right? <laughs> anyway, so we do a lot of simulation training. We get certified and signed off. Right. So that for me happened uh, mid October last year. Gotcha. And then uh, yeah, so I've got a basic ISS certification. Right. So I'm good to go to fly the space station as much as I want. I'm pulling an awful lot of shifts in mission control. Just to fly the space station. Is what they gave me the keys. We actually have keys. <laughs> Wait, there's a key. <laughs> so, but then there are advanced certifications beyond that. So right. in order to, to fly my Cygnus mission, I had some additional certification. I had to learn more about the Cygnus vehicle. So similar things. So there'll be a Boeing, a Boeing certification to right. launch Boeing CST-100. There'll be a SpaceX certification to launch the Crew Dragon. Uh, gotcha. so similar, and, and EVA, there's a little bit additional requirements you have Just to do to be stuff. the flight director for, for uh, cool. a spacewalk. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a fantastic question. So, do you show up 10 minutes in advance, or are you there for a couple hours preparing, and then it's like it's almost like an aircraft being passed over to the local tower or something? Oh, like, in terms of handing yeah, over between? Yeah. yeah, so we have an hour scheduled for handover. Right. So, Like an overlap. Yeah, exactly, an hour of overlap. So I show up, the guy or gal before me has typed up a console log about what happened, and so usually we those are emailed out as well. So right, you're constantly right. like, you wake up, first thing you do when you brush your teeth in the morning is read the console log, and then so one comes out, and early in the morning, one comes out in the afternoon, and yep. one comes out at about midnight. Is it so, three shifts, and there's three logs? Yep, yep. three shifts, nine-hour shifts, so with, an, with the hour overlap. Overlap. So, uh, yeah, so you kind of sit down, you start reading the log, and you kind of make some mental notes of questions you might have. Yep, I don't yep. quite understand what, what failed on the previous shift. What is the crew running behind? Is the crew ahead? What's the rest of the day look like? And then we kind of talk for a bit. And then I'll pull my team, because all the other flight controller disciplines are also doing the same thing. Right. right? So they're handing over, learning the state of their system. So I'll pull my team and say, okay, what do you guys got going on? Tell me, you know, what's the day look like? I'll say, are we still in one piece? Like, yeah, we're still in one Everything good to go? So right. then once I get happy, say, okay, I'm happy. So the, the, pre, the off-going flight director goes up on the flight loop, releases their shift. Right. Say, Thanks for the support. When your oncoming's happy, you're released. They head home, and then it's my space grab. Gotcha. So the there, there is hours. like a full-on handoff where you sort of hang out for a little while together, yep. for lack of a better term, hang out yep. to make sure that you're aware of what's of coming. Everything that's going on. Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I got to say this, like EJ sitting over there handing this space drill. Um, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, in my, I'm in my happy place right now. You're in your happy place. EJ's just handling, handling the space drill. What is this thing here? This is the PGT, the pistol grip tool. This is actually a plastic version of the PGT because the real one is over a million dollars. So when I said, hey, NASA, I'm going up to New York City to talk about space. Can yeah. I borrow a PGT? And they said, we'll give you a plastic one, Allison. <laughs> Have this. So, so yeah, this is a, it's a battery-powered drill that we use. Um, almost every spacewalk that we do requires change out of some sort of component outside the yep. space station. So you'll want to use that battery-powered drill. Um, They're normally got, not plastic. Normally not okay. plastic. We've this got is like a mass them. simulator. It's the same. Yeah, size. so we have three real ones on this on the space station. Uh, this is one that we would use in the neutral buoyancy lab, right? So one of the world's largest swimming pools is right, where right. we're doing all the the training because we're trying to simulate microgravity. So that's why you're floating in water, even though you're trying to simulate microgravity, you right. still have gravity in the water. Right. So if we had a really heavy metal tool, and you let go, it would sink to the bottom and probably hit a diver in the head on the way down. I've never thought of that. The yeah. tools have to be neutrally buoyant yeah, as well. Exactly. So that's why we make a lot of our training tools out of plastic. And you can see it actually has blue foam inside of it to help make it even make more it. neutrally buoyant. And so uh, so the idea is the astronaut, it's volumetrically, it's the exact same size as right. a real PGT. The astronaut would use that, and once they get into position, obviously this is non-functional. Right. We do have a functional version of a lightweight PGT. So once they get into position to where they would actually need to drive a bolt, scuba diver swaps out. That's kind of like a magic swap, we call it's it. It's like, uh, you reach out, down please. and then you... Yeah, exactly. They'll just take it and they'll give them because the functional one is heavier. Right. So the astronaut will actually use the functionality of the drill and then they'll swap back out to the volumetric version. Gosh. So a lot of the training that we do in the pool, we're using plastic the tools. plastic tools, yeah. Yep. And I, I was going to say, this seems like it has some real parts. Like, this looks like a real part. Yes. And this this handle, what do I call this thing? Flip it around it's, it's so they it's on both sides. Oh, it's on both sides. Ah. It's a bayonet, bayonet fitting. Okay. Uh, so the tool belt, the mini workstation that the astronauts wearing to yep. carry their tools around, um, it's got kind of a, it's got a swing arm off to the side. So it's a, you got bayonet probe and we have bayonet receptacles. So ah. imagine if you will, yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a hole with the slider over it. So I would release the slider, put this guy down in there, slide the slider over, and now that allows me to to carry. To carry it. So it's gun, not for power or anything like that. It's nope, for retention. It's just, yep, it's just for carrying it. <sighs> and of course, you've got these two soft loops down here. You're always going to be tethered to everything that you have. So make sure you're tethered to it. 
Now, and, I, have, uh, uh, I have a cordless drill at home, and <laughs> that adjusts the torque. Is that what this does here? Can uh, you just like down okay. things differently? Yes or? and no. Okay. All right, so you the real one would have switches back here, a power on and off, and it would have an alpha and bravo setting. Okay. You adjust the torque here. Okay. All so right. now I'm questioning myself. <laughs> You could well, just say whatever we want. Okay. <laughs> Some, someone's going to know the Somebody real answer. Somebody will see it and be like, actually. So the, the settings that you have mm -hmm. are, you've got speeds. Yep. So you've got counterclockwise or clockwise. Speeds of normally it's 10, 20, 30, 10, 30, 60 RPMs. Okay. okay. And then you've got seven torque settings, both uh -huh. an alpha and a bravo. So up to 14 different torque okay. settings. You can plug it into a computer. So you can change the torque settings back here. Uh -huh. uh, up here is your manual ratchet. You can either leave it in motor mode or you can rotate it to manual ratchet. And then this guy is representing, we have a MTL or multi-setting torque limiter, which is actually, it's a series of Belleville washers inside here that right. if for some reason, you, to avoid over torquing a bolt, this guy would go pop, 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 It's pop. like once you drive it in and it starts to slip or something. Yeah, exactly. So those are all the different colors. Because I could see that would be a bad day on the space station if you strip out a bolt or something. Yeah, it's a bad day. Over tighten yeah. it. The next astronaut has to re change the battery. Y'all change a lot of batteries. We well, have changed a lot of batteries. Yeah, so we're upgrading. So each of the eight solar arrays has, has anywhere between, now that we've got Oh, the old style batteries, nickel hydrogen, we had six batteries yeah, per yeah. solar array. So now we're changing out up to new lithium ion technology and we're able to use just three lithium ion batteries to replace six of those nickel hydrogen batteries. So we've done a series <laughs> of, I'm trying to remember, out of the power channels, how many we've actually replaced. I think we replaced three. Yeah. Quite a few. Yeah, it yeah. seems like uh, they're replacing we the battery have, today. Yeah, and so we, yeah, because it's a series of spacewalks, and they're yeah. going to get more complicated because we started with the inboard elements that were closer to the air, to the center of the space station that we could use the robotic arm. Right. Now that we're going to move to the outboard elements, so S6 that Ricky launched and P6 that I relocated on my STS-120 mission back in 2007. Yep. The robotic arm can't reach. Reach that far. That far, so it's a lot more manual labor with the astronauts. They have to like. Translating, down. yeah, exactly. Translating those those big batteries. And those batteries launch on the Japanese HTV vehicle. Right. So we've got the next HTV launch coming up in just a couple months. Gotcha. Well, we we said ten mil ten minutes with Allison here because you got talk a lot. all sorts of no. I mean, we could sit here for two hours and talk about stuff. <laughs> what else do we have? You, oh, have? you have the glove and you I have, have the, a glove, right? which I am not going to put my hands in because there have been a couple thousands of, of children it? putting their hands in here. Uh, but yeah, so this is a nope. this is the glove distracted by what's going on behind yeah. the camera. So this is um, an example of the glove that they would wear. So the neat thing about this is you notice how the, the grip is rubberized. Right. So we call it space walking, right. but they're not actually using their boots for anything. It's really... Right? Hand over hand. So this is a handrail, an example. On the outside of the space station, it's covered in these yellow handrails, and that's how the astronauts get from one side to the other. So obviously, you wouldn't want this to be a nice, smooth fabric. You want it to be something right. rubbery with grip Some so grip that you can... It hang on to that. And it's not so so I guess this is this is a thing you wouldn't want like grip tape or something abrasive on there because right. you don't want to rub against no, it. That'd be you bad. want rubber and smooth, smooth like smooth surfaces yes. as opposed to like yes. a sandpaper type of grip, right? Right. And so we say smooth, um, however, a lot of the areas that we work on the space station are on the velocity vector. Right. So like your positive x direction so you're flying into all that right, right. little debris. And some of these elements have been up there for 10, 15, 20 years yep. almost. So it's it's terrifying to see the number of pock marks that you have all over the space station. I saw little a picture tiny of a battery. Micro oh yes, yeah. exactly. Little tiny micrometeoroid hits all over the space station. So that's why if, if you've watched spacewalks, you'll notice every 90 minutes, at least every 90 minutes, they're doing a glove and a half check, which is the helmet absorption pad, the right. different thing. But they're looking at their gloves. So they're looking at every crease, every crevice, finger crotch, they're separating everything to make sure they don't have any cuts. Any cuts. Because they're trying to keep their eyes focused on where they're going. But right. there might be some MMOD strike kind of under here that right. they can't see or like something. Like hit it and it, it tore it a little bit or something. Yeah, yeah. It made a so, sharp surface or that's something. That's why we always need to make sure that the gloves are... I had never even... I mean, conditions. one side of the station is more worn than the other because it's the direction... It's the velocity vector you said, right? So it's flying in a certain way and it maintains that orientation. That part gets a little bit more yeah. beat up. And they, one of the only times... We, we flip the orientation sometimes yeah. uh, when we were flying space shuttle. So if you think about the way the space shuttle came up and docked to the space station, mm -hmm. it had those delicate tiles right. pointing the velocity vector. So you oh. wouldn't want for the 16 days it's up there, you wouldn't want those tiles. The being space shuttle to be blocking for the space station. So instead of flying positive XPV, we'd flip the space station to fly minus XPV. In the so now the Russian trained. segment, so yeah, so the shuttle flipped around the other way. And didn't the uh, the radiators, the radiator panels on the shuttle, get some impacts because they're oh, flying yeah. backwards? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. I never. Did you know that that they flipped the space station around? No, I never knew that. I didn't know that. Uh, today XPV. I learned. This is what we try to do. We sit down with people who are smarter than us and we learn some stuff, right? <laughs> 
So, well, Allison, I thank you so much for no the time. Problem. I know you got pleasure. all sorts of stuff going on, and uh, every time we come to the museum, we see Allison here. And so, thank you for the time you take to come over here and share all this sure. with the kids and stuff. Great talking with you guys. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good deal. Thanks for your interest. I love it. It's good. Oh, Excellent. So now we can just like stand up, and I'll tell the camera goodbye for now. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and shut the stream down. Again, it's Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum. It's New York City, and thanks everybody for joining us. And Alan, thanks again for all the time. All right. Thanks. Cool. Alrighty.